apology for that. I've been given that. Use it in court order. I mean, as sadly as we can see, there are some colleagues missing who are um, stuck on the motorway. But I think understanding was we do actually have to start the meeting on the advertised time. Um, members will know this is the first meeting since um, the sad passing of Queen Elizabeth II. So I'd like to start the meeting with a minute's silence uh, in her memory. If we could, and those who can stand, stand. Thank you, members. Thank you, members. God bless you. Yeah. So, first item on the agenda. Apologies for absence, and, and I think at this point we would people have actually said apologies rather than those who are stuck on the M4. So, any apologies? For... Chair, I've received apologies from Councillor Brooks and Councillor Kenton. Uh, Councillor Christine Bates and Central Apologies. She uh, retired from her own mayoral duties, so I'll be on the Okay, so I think those, those, uh, those are noted. Item two, any declarations of interest relating to items to be considered at this meeting? No declarations. Minutes of the meeting held on the 30th of June. AGM, they're pages 7 to 20. Those that were present at that meeting, are we happy there are a correct record? Have I got a proposal for those minutes? And so I keep the seconder. Councillor Shepherd Dupay. Thank you very much, members. Item 4 Petitions and Questions for the Public Understanding Orders 1925. We've received none. Item six is announcements, and so we'll see. We'll start with the chair's announcements, which I will proceed with. Um, I was, as I'm sure everybody across Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Services, saddened here at the passing of Her Majesty the Queen on Thursday, the 8th of September, 2022. Uh, Queen Elizabeth II reigned for 70 years. It was a symbol of great unity for our country. Following the announcement of her death, the service supported Operation London Bridge, the name given to the funeral plan. I know that staff worked hard, incredibly hard, alongside partners to ensure that this operation was appropriately supported and that the, high, the normal high level of operational response was maintained. And thank you for everybody that took part in that effort. And indeed, we are receiving a report later on about um, about the, what, we, what went on during the summer in terms of the heat wave and those act, act, act activities. With part of the funeral procession, the committal service take part in Windsor, a collective effort ensured that the normal operational response was maintained during this period of national mourning. Ahead of the funeral, our protection team also worked closely with fire safety inspectors from Oxfordshire Fire and Rescue and Surrey Fire and Rescue Service to inspect over 150 sleeping premises in Windsor, Maidenhead and the surrounding areas, obviously big public safety uh, work there and it uh, carried out very well of course. And with the proclamation of King Charles III, as I'm sure all members here would wish to wish King Charles III well as he begins his reign. So we've had a ministerial appointment uh, following the announcement of Liz Truss as Prime Minister on the 5th of, November, the 5th of September. 
It's about a month ago, isn't it? What's happened since then? Further ministerial appointments have been made. Jeremy Quinn has been appointed as the Minister of State with responsibility of fire, policing, tackling crime at the Home Office. And on behalf of the uh, Fire Authority, I would generally like to wish well Jeremy luck in his new post and look forward to working him very closely in, in the future. So the chair's, chair's internship. In August, 10 interns joined different teams from across the service as part of the chair's internship scheme. The scheme was the first of its kind for the service and offered the interns opportunities to develop their workplace skills and gain experience working in teams from across Rob Archer Fire and Rescue Service. The interns visited four different stations over the course of their placements where crews and cadet instructors led a range of activities that provided both informative learning input as well as fun demonstrations. Interns also contributed to work in their designated departments. I mean, I was here actually on the first day when they were, when that, that was uh, that was they, they were given their their appointments. I must say, an incredibly impressive group of uh, individuals, and I, I know that they work very hard. Um, in their individual departments and, and across the whole of that internship. And at the end of the five weeks, interns were presented with certificates to celebrate the completion of their internships. While sadly I was not able to be there on the day, I did have the pleasure of meeting the interns as I referred at the beginning of the internship. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them for their, all their efforts and wish them all the best for the future. And they will all, I'm sure, have a very, very bright future. I'd also like to express my thanks to the project team behind the internship who worked so hard over the past year to prepare and deliver the scheme. Without their hard work, none of this would have been possible. I mean, indeed, a lot of work goes into that, and it was much appreciated. Since the Fire Authority last met, the service has been a hard at work engaging with communities across Berkshire. Both Newbury and Whitney Wood Fire Stages have hosted successful open days in recent weeks, attracting hundreds of visitors and helping us to reconnect with our communities following the pause of open days caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. These events provide an excellent opportunity to share prevention, recruitment and other important messaging, as well as offering a family-friendly day out for guests. We are also proud to show our support for the LGBTQ community at Reading Pride. Crew from Caversham Road Fire Station join other staff from across the service at King's Meadow to join in this year's celebrations. Again, I'd like to thank everybody who's involved in preparing and supporting these invaluable community engagement projects. And finally, on se Sunday, September the 4th, so we joined the Firefighters Memorial Trust Service of Remembrance of the Holy Sepulchre Church in London. We are pleased to join fire and rescue services from across the country in recognition of the commitment and dedication of firefighters across the United Kingdom. After a short church service, standard bearers and guests proceeded to the memorial for a wreath laying ceremony. On September 9th, staff across the service also paused to remember all those who tragically lost their lives including 343 firefighters in the terror attacks on the World Trade Center in New York in 2001. I think it's very important we continue to remember all those who've made the ultimate sacrifice in the line of duty. And the date of the next meeting, we'll deal with that now, it's in the, it does actually come up in the agenda. Since publishing the agenda for this meeting, the date of the next fire authority meeting, previously scheduled for the 1st of November, has been moved to the 19th of December, having a Christmas meeting members. Outlook invitations to fire authority members have been subsequently updated and the website's been updated as, as well. So that's a note obviously for your, for your diary. So that's the end of the chair's announcements. We'll know that the chief fire officer would like to say a few words as well. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, just uh, three points from me. Uh, members, firstly, I'd like to uh, extend a warm welcome to Paul Bramble, uh, Head of Corporate Services. Paul joins us from uh, Oxfordshire Fire and Rescue Service. Uh, so, warm welcome to Paul as his first Royal Oxfordshire Fire Authority meeting. Uh, and on a slightly more sombre note, or maybe happy for Tony, I'd like to say a very fond farewell to Tony Vincent, Head of Business and Information Systems. This will be Tony's last Royal Oxfordshire Fire Authority meeting. So. Uh, he will be attending management committee, I believe, but uh, Tony, uh, can we say takes retirement or resigns? Or uh, I'm sure members will join me in thanking Tony for his uh, fantastic contribution to Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service on behalf of the authority. 
over the years that he's worked for is in advancing our business and information systems and modernising the ICT infrastructure. So, thank you very much, Tony. Congratulations. Uh, and then I'd like to give a brief overview, Chair, on the uh, outcome of the HMI CFRS inspection, uh, which concluded uh, some months ago now. It feels like a long time ago, and a lot's happened since then. Uh, so a slight overview on the process is that we are due to receive what's called a pre-publication check uh, copy of the report in the next couple of weeks. Uh, that's not uh, a formal document. We get an opportunity to evidence check some of the information. It then goes back to the HMICFRS and they will publish formally the report uh, probably in January of next year at the same time as the State of Fire report. Uh, but immediately after the inspection, we did have what's called a hot debrief where HMI CFRS go over uh, their initial findings and give us feedback uh, following the, the field work that they undertake uh, for those six to eight weeks. Uh, so a couple of the uh, highlights that I can give from that hot debrief, bearing in mind that it's not the formal report that has to go through evidence check and uh, various stages of moderation, is that in relation to the areas for improvement that the service had from the previous uh, inspection, uh, all but one area we could demonstrate significant movement uh, against uh, those areas for improvement so that we progressed quite well. The extent to which will be uh, clearly uh, clarified in the actual report. There was the one area that we didn't progress was a conscious choice not to progress because there was some national work that we could take advantage of uh, and that wasn't available to us at the time. Uh, so again, whilst action plans are in place and we do uh, plan to progress that area, timescales didn't fit with our inspection. So uh, that's not a surprise to us and HMI CFRS are well aware of our rationale for why that's the case. Uh, in terms of a thing they call causes of concern, whilst we can't get any formal confirmation, of course we ask in that hot debrief process uh, whether or not HMI CFRS have any areas we're worried about. Uh, and they raised nothing in that uh, hot debrief that I would expect them to if there was a safety critical area or something that uh, needed to be brought to our attention immediately and couldn't wait for the report. So again, we take that as a positive. Uh, and finally, uh, something I suppose to be most proud about or most excited about, I guess, having not seen the report and bearing in mind that uh, none of this is evidence checked yet, are the comments that the inspection team made about the warm welcome, the great organisation in preparation for the inspection and the fact that what we talked about in what we call the strategic briefing, where we have uh, 45 minutes to present uh, what we uh, think they need to hear and see around uh, what Royal Box Fire and Rescue Service does in terms of the provision of services. Uh, we we uh, identified the priorities that we felt that they needed to be aware of in that uh, strategic briefing and throughout the field work what they reflected back to us was that their staff uh, experience the culture we described we wanted to see or we wanted to aim for uh, felt that the, the way that staff engaged with them presented the service in a very professional and positive light uh, and was actually a, a very pleasant inspection environment for them to work in. So effectively, the culture we talk about, they witnessed firsthand as they moved around the organisation, engaging with the various teams uh, and staff across the organisation. So culturally, it feels like it was quite a positive experience for HMI CFRS. Hopefully the final report in January uh, we'll elaborate on that and we'll kind of uh, bring to life what we heard in the hot debrief and if we're not being too optimistic. Uh, but all in all, it was a huge amount of work. A big thank you to Katie, uh, Angela Smith particularly in the performance team, but then all of the heads of service as well. The amount of work that staff put in to make sure that the evidence was available for the inspection team to make their job as easy as possible but also to show the service in the most positive light uh, is absolutely why we feel the way we do and quite positive at the moment about the, the inspection process. Huge amount of work. We've, we were glad to get through it, but it is good to do. And then of course, uh, dim and distant memory because we've been extremely busy since with the heat wave and Operation Bridge. That's it for Chief Announcement Chair. Thank you, thank you Chief. And also on my behalf, I'd like to thank the staff for the tremendous efforts that, uh, that were made.
for the inspection, obviously in other areas, but particularly for the inspection. The initial meeting was was, was a good one with, we, when we uh, were online in the virtual setting. Obviously, we await to see what the outcome is. Um, I was going to ask the Chief, if we'll, for the December the 19th meeting, will we be able to update anything more then, or is that still not unlikely? Not likely, Chair, sorry. That's okay. That's a late one. Anyhow, thank, thank, thanks for everybody involved, involved with that. So we can we can move on. Um, and good to see people. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, Colin. I may just add to your announcements if I can. Um, I'd like to echo your congratulations to the um, to the passing out of the chairman's interns. Um, I, I was actually there with the vice chair for that passing out, and, and what an impressive group of people they were. Um, so much so, um, I think I'm going to embarrass him now and say congratulations to Abdi Fatah sitting next to me, who was one of the interns who's now been taken on, on uh, as our democratic support system for a while. Um, I'd like to, through you, Chair, pass my congratulations to him on joining us. Um, and also, if I may, just uh, through you, Chair, uh, congratulate Tony. Well, I don't know if it's congratulate or commiserate, um, but Tony's been with us for quite a while looking after our ICT systems, and, uh, and I would like to add my thanks to him and wish him well, and hope he doesn't buy too fast a car. Um, that he um, hurts himself. So, uh, congratulations, Tony, and we wish you well. Thank you, Chair. Well, thank, thanks, thanks for those comments. And say, thank you, Tony. And uh, as an ICT man, leaving with the thanks of everybody you show you've done your job, you've done your job well. You can't always say that about council IT systems. <laughs> and, and congratulations, young man. Excellent. It's good to see you here. Uh, they're all very high caliber of, of interns. I'm sure they'll find their way either into the service or other services or other, other gainful, gainful employment. Okay, for that. So, item six, issues arising from the Audit and Governance Committee. I've not had any notification that they were, so we can move on. Questions from members understanding order 30, received none. Notices, notices of motion, understanding order 44, received none. And there were no recommendations from committee item 9 and 10, which is some of the first substantive business of the evening. And Graham Britton is going to um, talk us through that. Thank you, Graham. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Um, if it assists, what I propose to do is to take uh, the meeting through the amendments that are highlighted in the appendices in sequential order, uh, then flag with your uh, Mayor Culper on my part on page 46 before taking you back to the recommendations that start on page 21. Um, so, on that basis, if I take you to page 28, and I, I will count it through these journals. That's what yeah. absolutely <laughs> So, page 28. Um, uh, SO3, this reflects that our democratic services team are to a great extent at the mercy of the six appointing authorities in terms of the date when we can have our authority meeting. So we're trying to balance and uh, not leaving uh, the annual meeting of the fire Authority too far into the municipal year with recognising that we are sort of beholden to the yes, last meeting indeed. of the appointing councils. And if I take you to page 29, the, the highlighted text there uh, just uh, elucidates to some extent the process for appointing the chairman of the power authority for the municipal year. The next uh, amendment worth drawing members' attention to is at page 35. Uh, this uh, uh, starts a, a new inserted SO45A which um, expands on the remit of, or makes express uh, or can be within the remit of a, a notice of, of motion specifically to deal with uh, members who may be in receipt of SRAs other than by virtue of being a group leader and for the option of the authority uh, following a certain process for them yes. to be removed from that SRA position by the authority provided that a notice of motion is supported before, uh, by seven members detailing the grounds uh, and with good cause to ensure that no such motion is taken capriciously, uh, Chairman. Um, page 46, um, no, no, this is where I you need to draw the mayor call to your attention, but this, this relates to committee matters and covers two areas. One is uh, to uh, 
provide that the dates of the inaugural committee meetings, uh, uh, the dates of the inaugural meetings of the committee, uh, do not either occur on the date of the annual meeting of the authority, nor nor occur on, on the same date as each other. The second element is the appointment of chairman, and the, sh the sharp eyed amongst you would have, would have spotted the mayor call for, which is, uh, and I'll just take members to it because this is a correction that yeah. the officer needs to put forward. And that's that um, the inserted SO, I need to make sure I get this right, SO 107B little b, the reference there to, to the little b should have been an A. So it, it follows a pattern there. What well, That's to reflect that. Um, if there is a member presiding, the local government Act 1972 bakes in or hard wires the fact that they will have um, uh, a second or, or casting vote. So there's there's a there's an option there where where there's no member presiding, a, a, me a member is chosen to preside, but in the quality of the quality of votes, then it would be um, the vice chairman by default from the preceding year would preside yeah. at the election for the chairman for the municipal year. Um, that. That covers really uh, the substance of Appendix A, and then I can I'll just canter through the other the other amendments. Uh, the first one to draw your attention to is Appendix B, at page 52, highlighted, highlighted there at the bottom. That is to reflect uh, the change in the role or the expansion of the role of the, of the former lead member for strategic assets, and that therefore now includes strategic asset and sustainability. So that's reflected there. The other amendment, lower down, combines two lead member roles into one, but also reframes the role of what was previously called uh, the organ. I'm looking at place, the organisational development champion uh, to to be the member development cha champion because that actually reflects historically what the role of that post holder uh, would undertake. Also. Um, Included within that is the conversion of the EDI ED honorary champion into a substantive champion. So it's going to be an EDI uh, champion rather than an honorary champion. That, that's yeah. sort of an ancillary uh, amendment to, to, to reflect the decision taken by the authority at its annual meeting. Um, moving swiftly on to Appendix C, Management Committee Terms of Reference page 58 and again that reflects uh, that in future the strategic assets lead member will also be called but is you know the strategic assets and sustainability will lead member uh, appendix d lead member role descriptions at page 70 uh, these have been amended uh, accordingly to reflect those changes that I've, yes. just, that I've just referenced earlier and also uh, change the reporting requirements of both lead members and member champions rather than to report annually they, they are now tasked with uh, the lesser burden of reporting uh, and annually rather than by annually. Yes. Sorry, sorry. Page 71 covers the changes to lead member and page 74 changes those obligations in respect of member champions. Uh, Chairman, that's a quick canter through those um, changes to those constitutional documents, and I'm happy to take questions to the recommendations. So, so, any questions for Graham? Remember, these are questions. Go on. Thank you, Chair. Uh, with regards to the um, addition of a, uh, a vote of no confidence, I take it it can only be, you're saying it can't be just um, on a spurious. It's got to be to do with the member's code of conduct. Is that correct? It certainly, it would certainly have to be not spurious. And what we've tried to reflect is that it would, in essence, reflect a conduct issue. So yes, in essence, yes. And and with regards to the addition of the member, is it the member champions or the lead members? Yeah. It, it, what, what's being added? Um, there's there's a um, the 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 EDNI position previously was an honorary champion that's been converted to a substantive champion and of the existing lead member role the two have been put into one so the overall number stays the same. Okay. Uh, uh, one other question is, if 
I may check. Thank you. Uh, um, I mean, this is the substantive part of the of this meeting. It, it, it's just. Is this the reason this meeting's been called as an extraordinary fire authority meeting, just to do this? Well, I, I will take that. Um, we, to make those changes, we, we we need to have a full fire authority meeting. But it, subsequently, in light of events in the summer and, and other other developments, it, it gave a further justification to have this meeting. In, and I think it, the timing of this meeting is now very apposite given what, what, has, what has occurred over the summer and some other, other issues and also the pattern now changes for the December meeting to December. But you're, you're, you're right, Councillor Lee, to, to make these changes you have to do the full fire authority and obviously at the AGM we weren't able to make these changes. And I'm going to, it reflects our priorities in terms of sustainability and quality and diversity and firming up, firming up those roles. And we also looked to, as well to do, obviously at the same time, to do, stand, to make, do the standing orders, which did need tidying up. But I think that's part of the debate. But that, that is the answer to your question. And it's come from me rather than because rather than it was my decision ultimately to help us have this meeting. Thank you, Chair. Council Smith. If we go back to page 46, um, item SO107B, little b. It says that the, uh, if, if we uh, don't manage to elect a member to lead the election, then the vice chairman from the previous preceding year takes over. What happens in the event that the um, vice chair from the preceding year is no longer a member of the fire authority due to a change in perhaps election results? We would have to revert to uh, the, the little a uh, councillor. Good question. But the, the whole purpose of, of the uh, section B is if there's a hung vote, so to speak. You, you do raise you do raise a, a fair point, um, Councillor. <laughs> um, a slightly circular reference. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I suppose one option, Chairman, is, is, is to, to take the standing orders at, uh, as presented at this meeting, subject to any other members that Chairman wish yeah. to, uh, yes. to pr pr provide, and then revisit them at the later juncture. Yeah, I think that is. I mean, <laughs> any other questions? Councillor Cannon. Thank you. <coughs> I Got a similar question on page 29, um, standing order 8 um, says that the vice chair will preside over the, the election of the chair, um, but presumably that is on the assumption that the chair from the previous year is going to be one of the candidates um, for election to the chair forthcoming year. What would happen if the chair is not standing for re-election and the vice chair is standing for election, which seems reasonably a reasonable possibility. Um, I mean we are we are behind all of this is the fact that the chair and the, the vice chair or whoever is chairing that meeting will have a casting vote. Um, and um, be it the, ch the previous chairman or the previous vice chair, they will at least have had the experience of um, working with one of the, the candidates in that instance. So, uh, like Councillor Mike Smith, I, I, I'm also suggesting that maybe that, uh, that particular part of uh, the standing orders uh, and, and the Amendments that we've got need a, a little bit more work. No, thank, I mean, I obviously been talking here to the monitor officer. I think the word in SO9, it says he's absent from the meeting or is standing for election as chair, another member chosen by the committee. So we just need to add those words. I mean, thank you for raising these accounts as text. I mean, it's, it's, it's I think, but yes, that would, uh, that sure. would cover it. Uh, I wasn't quite wanting to get to that point actually because 
Well, what I'm saying is that instead of it going to SO9 and then it being open to election for anyone to chair that meeting, uh, I'm suggesting that it is more appropriate that in the absence of the vice chair, provided the previous chair is not a candidate, that that previous chair chair that part of the meeting. I'll take a point. Chairman, the two, two very good points have been put forward. So, so rather than try to draft on the hoof, as it were, and put uh, amended, res amended uh, amendments to the meeting, I, I think um, in terms of uh, putting something in place, because uh, the annual meeting is some way off, we could uh, put it on the agenda to, to subsequent to revisit this at, at the December meeting, just as a, as a very brief item to take on board those two very good points, which yeah. really do arise at the annual meeting. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Thank Oh, sorry, Councillor. Yeah, thank you. Um, page 76, the role of the honorary member champion. 9.1 uh, is being removed. Um, is there any rationale behind that as the armed forces champion? Are they still remaining and uh, remaining as an honorary champion? The, the, honorary, the, the armed forces remain as an honorary, as an honorary champion. Absolutely. Any more questions, Colin? Again. Thank you, Chair. So, with, so with all these um, included, are, are we still within the uh, the rule that only um, ten special responsibility allowances will be awarded? Yes. Yeah. And that, that's why we did the amalgamation, of the amendment to develop to, to keep within those rules. We don't want to spend public money. Um, Without wood course. Uh, just to clarify that point, uh, so only, only each member can only get one responsibility allowance. Because I, I, when I was reading the report last night, it implied that somebody could get more than one. No. Yeah, because you're only allowed one. Exactly. One law. No, and, that, and that's absolutely the case. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely the case. Thanks. Thanks for those points, everybody. Sorry. Uh, Councillor McElroy. Sorry, this is uh, so something that's um, errata that is insubstantial. Should I just pick that up afterwards, or if there's you know a typo or something like that, is that something we need to deal with now? Or? Oh, I'm, I'm, don't hold back, um, <laughs> Councillor. Do, do, do draw my attention to it, and I can. Um, okay, I'll make sure that's. I apologise to everyone. Uh, page seventy-seven point two point. Page um, 70. Yeah, 7.2.3. Um, head of facilities, fleet, and estates. Should that be in there? And then there's a word regular that I think should be regularly. But they're very insubstantive. We'll make sure they're corrected. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, members. So we are going to return to this to just do those tidying exercises and in that spirit I was going to move an amendment tonight to change the language around and terminology around chairman and vice chairman to chair and vice chair. I will move that amendment at the, at the December meeting just to tidy up that language and we'll, we, will, we will go through this with a fine tooth comb but I'm not going to move that amendment tonight because we're going to bring this back to the December meeting. Uh, you know, it's but, but just, so that I wanted to say that now before we proceed to the formal debate on these um, on these matters. So if anybody wants to speak to these items, that's your, this is your opportunity. So Dudley, thank you very much. On page seventy-one, uh, the lead members' roles. I noticed that uh, to be a recognised me recognised media contact has been deleted um, and the fact that we are asking to publish an annual report on work and undertaken. Uh, can you tell why those have been deleted? I can I can answer the one about the 
annual report because that is, uh, that's moved up, uh, that, that's covered. Um, the, there's a highlighted bullet point higher up, so the annual report part is covered there. Well, it says to be involved in the content of the annual report, but not an annual report on the work undertaken by that lead member. Page 71. The media contact has been deleted. Um, and to publish an annual report on the work undertaken. I mean, lead members are, you know, lead member for their role and get an allowance for to do for to do so. Um, to just have their work as part of the annual report seems to me, you know, it's just uh, somewhat remiss. I mean, some of the work that, and that lead members do is, is quite important in their own area. Um, and I think that we should still have an annual report from that member where members can question that member on their annual report. Uh, thank you, Councillor Dudley. Uh, 3.14 in the report covers uh, that point particularly. And it's more to do with the timing of the half yearly lead member report uh, and uh, the fact that there is often little to put into those reports uh, or those first reports completely agree that uh, the importance of those reports uh, is not up for question but consolidating into one annual lead member report uh, at the end of the municipal year to update on the work of that lead member and, uh, is the intention with no uh, suggestion at all that the lead member's role or work or engagement with the relevant head of service or director or in other committee meetings where appropriate uh, changes in any way at all. It's just the reporting to speak like that. So, for clarification, Chair, what you're saying is that there will still be a lead member annual report and it won't just form part of the fire authorities annual report. It will be a separate report. Is that correct? We think that point may have been deleted in error of the, uh, of the member description because the intention absolutely is for one annual lead member report, yes. Yeah. This is the word. So that should be reintroduced. And, and the question about being recognised by your contact? I am um, through you, Chair, is that okay? Mm. So, uh, yes, in terms of uh, the media contact, obviously our communications and engagement team uh, are generally the service recognised media contact. Uh, members will obviously have a role in terms of responding to the media on specific questions that, that are uh, related to fire authority business. But I think the intention there is that the day-to-day -day contact around media and therefore the designated media contact will be comms and engagement and where comms and engagement needs signposts to a member they'll signpost to the relevant member so we can collate and understand all of the media requests and engagement that come into the okay, service. Through, through your chair. Of course our, our communications department are fantastic in, in dealing with the press but of course there are political um, things to be taken into consideration and of course we wouldn't expect or indeed want our officers to be um, to be dealing with any questions of a political nature which the lead members should be dealing with for their area. Yeah, yes, I, I, I agree with that. I think this is in terms of our the authorities let's sort of say stance on this issue that we do it through communications. Members of course free to talk to the media in, from their positions at any at any time um, on certainly on political matters. So I think there is a distinction between what I call the political part of it and also what, the representation from the authority. I think this is what is being driven at. It's that it's making that dividing line, isn't it? It's probably the wording may not necessarily because it's just been struck out, cut through. We could alter the wording, I think, to reflect, set a reflect. Okay, that. so as we're voting on this, how would you suggest we alter the wording?
so, so we'll undelete that and add you more additional words to it. So we're, we're undeleting both of those, yeah? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I think this is good. I mean, we've got these 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 standing orders and the members are owned by all members. This isn't, and they said, you know, and it's good that people are identifying these these, these issues. And I'm pleased with it. That's why we're having the meeting. It's not for us just to dict that. And, and they're good. They're good points. And I think obviously good points raised in in, in, in council to that. So that's why we have it. Thank you, Councillor Cannon. Yeah, what is the purpose of this change that has been done that we're now undoing? Why has this change been deemed necessary? We were going to open this debate, and in fact, we've sort of lapsed into more questions. But from from my point of view, when, when obviously we, we have got a new administration running 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 the authority, we wanted to give greater greater priority to sustainability. Not to say that it wasn't given priority before, but in terms of the job, the title, and the role for, for in that role, but in terms of the equality and diversity role, I think that if you have to you have to compare having a, an individual member champion for organisational development, the great job that was being done in that role as against a fully paid member for equality and diversity at a time when the inspectorate has specifically drawn attention to that, when, when services are being judged on that issue. I think it's only appropriate that we have a, we have a lead members as a paid role uh, and doing annual reports and being accountable if necessary to the, to the media. And so we just wanted to give more substance to that. We are, we're not costing authority any money because to do that, we've amalgamated one of the other, other roles. And the, me and the members involved are happy to do that. We've discussed it, obviously, in advance. So that's the purpose of doing this. And also, at the time, we did take the opportunity to think, well, let's tidy up the standing orders to draw us in line with other authorities. And I'm going to say, the timing of the annual meeting, I thought, you know, at the end of June, seemed a little long to, to my to my mind I'm shortening in a sense I'm shortening my term here if we have the meeting when I think it will be and other, and other issues around the way we did them we do that do the meetings and this will be whoever's in control of the authority they'll be used with the same rules uh, and so I think these are better tidying up that's why we're doing it thank you for your answer but that wasn't the question the question relates to about why you are in effect attempting to limit the roles of the lead member um, which was the actual question because what is what is the justification or the reason that you actually found to actually amend the role of, of the, the lead member's responsibilities around this but you know almost muzzling them in relation to the press I, I, well I mean I don't think we're doing muzzle, muzzled it I think we're making the distinction between people being free to dis I mean with social media I can come at the end of this meeting and say what I want to and, and, and then the, the media would probably, I'm not going to do that, but you know, I could. And the media will then pick up and say, why did you say that? And I'm then accountable. Nothing to do with the communications team. However, if, it's, if, if a, a query comes in about quality and diversity, the communications team might, and we sort of press announcement, might decide in certain cases it might be appropriate for me as the chair to deal with that rather than, than the lead member. After that, I would consult with the lead member and, and in that instance, and we would decide. So that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the, the authority's role in, in, in the, dealing with the media in their official job description, rather than the political side, which we're all free to do at any time as members of this fire authority and contact the media about issues that, that concern them, whether they're a lead member, quite frankly, or an independent member of authority. And, and, I, and again, I actually think it's healthy if people do speak to the media, media, but it's who they're representing when they do that. And this is what this distinction's about. Just for clarity, if you don't mind, Chair. Um, so, the lead members now are less of uh, a role because you're, they're not actually speaking on behalf of the authority on their areas. They're not the official media contact for their areas. That's being moved to the communication it, it, team. It, well, it's, it will be designated, and I would suggest in most instances where it's specifically to do with your, your role, if, if it's a positive, but it would be, would be directed to the lead member, but it may be directed to the chair or the vice chair or other members. I think this is what we're doing. It, I, I'm not, one thing I don't want to do is to water down people's uh, roles, because I know people already are working very hard in these roles. Can I add to that, Chair, for you, obviously? Uh, so, uh, in terms of the uh, comms and engagement team in relation to collating and signposting or directing 
media enquiries to the relevant officer or member on specific matters. Uh, my understanding in terms of the lead member role descriptions in this document is there's been some either neatening up of duplication or some clarification in areas. The clarification around the uh, to be a recognised media contact uh, and, and I think the recommended uh, amendment is helpful uh, is in terms of uh, not about watering down the members' opportunity to do that. It's about the organisation being able to collate and understand where media enquiries are coming from and also, also ensure that the right member uh, is being put up for uh, specific uh, media enquiries, whether that be based on skill set or indeed lead member role. So if it, were, if it were to be a matter for strategic assets and sustainability and we have a lead member for that, of course, in conjunction with the Deputy Chief Fire Officer and the uh, Head of State Fleet Equipment, then the lead member for that area would be uh, the political nominee for any media inquiry about that. Thank you. No, it's, a, it's a good debate, and I think it's one of these fine line distinctions, but I think it's worth raising these roles. We don't, you know, it's not a diminution of member roles. Um, Councillor Dexter Smith. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to support what Councillor Cannon said. I have had experience as a journalist myself, and I know journalists like to um, approach members in, in a, a democratic organisation to get a member point of view as well as an officer point of view. And I think if the result of this change is that the, the lead member who is the most obvious person that the media would go to in any case, simply because they're deemed to be responsible for that area, is actually going to have support withdrawn from them by the authorities' press office or not to be fully briefed in advance, then I think that would be a negative thing. And conversely, uh, it, it actually helps, I think, all members that uh, the press office or any member who's approached by the press can point to the fact that such and so such and such lead member is the person who is designated as the person to speak for members on this matter. So I, I just leave you to think on that. No, thank I mean, these part, I'm not also started my working life as a journalist, so we, we come and say, I think with this, this is about making sure that when in media inquiries come into specifically to your role, that the member actually, rather than talking off the fly, should we speak, is actually given a proper briefing on those issues. That's also part of the reasoning behind this. But again, individual members, if they're phoned up by the media to do with any incident in their areas, fires, completely free to talk on their part about it. But if they're doing it within with their people with the limited member role, this is actually providing, I think, extra support through the, through the service. But as I say, the wording just needed to be, I think, changed, and I'm grateful the members have brought this up. This is why, you know, this is why we have members to raise these issues. So I don't see any more people um, signalling. So at this point, we do go. We normally go into the debate, and I think people have already heard and see why my reasoning behind this. Does any member want to, before I vote on all of these, apart from the standing orders, does any member want to? Um, Want to want to say something in terms of the actual debate? Yeah, you need a, a motion and a second before well, that debate. Yes. Well, the motion we are going. Yes. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Dudley. We will be. We will be. The mo sorry. Thank you. Do you mind? Okay. Just if it's it, just if it assists, Chairman. I, I think if we take if yes. we take the, the motions. Um, individually and, and we can cross the bridge in terms of member role description as we get to it but in terms of uh, the recommendation yeah. one in terms of the standing orders now there were some typographical errors that have been picked up and they'll be reflected in the minutes and then there are substantive changes that will be required to reflect uh, the eventualities that might happen at the annual meeting so one proposal could be to to move that the amended standing orders are approved subject to the typographical uh, correct and highlighted, which would be reflected in the minutes. Then they they are passed, 
and then at the next meeting we can address those issues that Around really only arise at yeah. the annual meeting. So that would be one way to propose uh, the first motion. Okay. Uh, and then um, the second motion about the terms of reference, that, that's been non-contentious. The third one about the terms of reference, that's been non-contentious. Now, in terms of the amended role description, um, there's been a form of words put forward. Um, one in terms of reinstating the deletion of uh, that line about the preparation of the annual report, and then the deputy chief executive came up with some wording for the um, media contacts. So, one option in terms of uh, that motion 2.4 would be to take on board those yes. amendments as part of the substantive motion. And then we revert to the other uh, motions, 2.5 and 2.6. So that, that would be one yeah. way to, to cover, so get some of the motions across others. Thank you. Well, I, as I said, I was just moving on to the what we were actually approving, but I, I thank you, grateful for the, for the, for, for the clarification. So, subject to those those clarifications, which I think obviously members have heard, we are going to approve those amendments that we talk about. I items 2.1 to 2.6, obviously, if they're carried. So, at that point, subject to those to those to, to those qualifications, we um, we can open then a debate on those items. Any member wants to speak to those. To those to those items 2.1 to 2.6 and then I, what I would do I'm going to vote I'm going to have a vote on the more individually after that oh, good chair you need a second I will ask for a seconder councillor Jeffrey debate goes up goes up sorry uh, Sorry, Judge Council, I didn't miss you at the bottom. So, Councillor Lovelock to second. And who's anybody wants to propose them? Well, I think you proposed them. I proposed them. Okay, yeah. just think, sorry. I proposed them. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I proposed seconded by Councillor Lovelock. Okay. So, does any member want to speak to these on to these items? <laughs> Councillor Cannon. I think what we've got is a, a confusion here. Um, it, it, I think there's a lack of clarity on what we're actually voting on. Um, we're vote, almost voting on things uh, to be changed on the hoof. Um, it, it doesn't feel right. It feels very uh, slapdash. Um, we're, I, we've come had discussions and questions which have highlighted that there are things that need to be changed. Um, and I just think it's unwise probably to vote this through in a rush when we really ought to consider properly um, the items that members from both sides have brought up uh, as being issues. Thank you. Any other member want to speak to, to this? Uh, Councillor Dudley, are you? Yeah, thank you Chair. Um, well, I, I, I reiterate what my friend Councillor Cannon has, has just said. Well, we're being asked to vote on, on a paper which by its sheer nature is complicated and, and I you know I have some sympathy with with you and, and the officers in, in trying to put this together. Um, the fact of the matter is that it, that is a, a very, very important paper. Um, the sheer fact that we are sitting here in a, an extraordinary fire authority meeting, which is normally a one item agenda in an extraordinary fire authority. Um, shows the importance that you, as the uh, as the chair, is putting on this paper. Um, if, if it isn't that important, I question why we'd be called to an extraordinary fire authority meeting. So, so therefore, I would say it is important that we get it right before we go and vote on it, because I'm quite sure that there are members on both sides of, of this chamber that could not actually say what they're voting on on every single one of these items. And if they can, I will question them on it. Because it is confusing and it is ambiguous at the moment. And I think it's important that we get it right 
before we vote on it. I'm broadly in favour of it. All right, I'm not arguing against it, but I don't think at this moment, because it will become an official paper that we work with over the next however many years it is until it's changed again, that we get this right first time. I, I, I really can't, I, I won't vote against this paper, but at the moment I can't vote for it, and I would challenge any member on any side of this chamber to say what they're actually voting for on each one of these items. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I'm going to take Councillor Vernet, and then I'll take other ones. Um, thank you, Chairman. I, I, I suppose I, I do sit here quite disappointed that the Conservatives are playing politics with what, what's quite a simple changes to the uh, Constitution. When, when I first joined the uh, Fire Authority, um, Councillor Dexter uh, um, pointed out to me that there's no party politics in, in the Fire Authority, that we all work together, that we don't deliberately try to sow confusion, that we don't try and make party political points. Um, that we don't try and rubbish the administration, we all work together. So I'm disappointed to be sitting here uh, hearing sort of uh, an attempt by the Conservatives to sow confusion, to, to uh, nitpick, to, um, to, to, to generally try to confuse the issue, to, to, to play to the camera. Um, look, this, this, this is quite simple. We're going we're gonna to pass the stuff that needs to be passed with the typological changes and then we're going to bring some other stuff back to, at, um, to, to the next meeting where, where, there's particular, where there's a particular issue. It couldn't be simpler. I, I think we should just push on with this, get it done, and then revisit those bits that uh, um, the, the Conservatives are causing problems with you, you know, at, at, at the relevant time to do with the annual meeting. It, it, it's quite simple. I, I think this game plan should stop. And we should go back to working together as one fire authority, working for the benefit of the residents of Berkshire, supporting the officers, fighting fires. Not 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 playing these games. Very disappointed in them. Thank you, Councillor Vernon. Councillor Linden, you you indicated. Thank you, Chair. Um, I disagree with what uh, Councillor Werner has just stated. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I want the best for this fire authority. I don't believe the opposition are uh, trying to nitpick. What we want to do is to make sure it's right. And I can't see it's a problem if we make a decision, which I've got no problem with in two and a half months' time. Fortunately, we've got another full council meeting to discuss the local plan for four of us but, uh, at West Berkshire. But I think we do need to get it right. And certainly when I was reading the report, and, and it needs to be checked through, that there may be... Uh, the assumption, which I read and might have read it wrongly, that we, in addition to what's been said and what I said earlier, that there may be SRAs going more than one SRA going to one person. So I think what we want to do is to get it right, um, and uh, and I think delaying a final decision to December the 19th is not a, a, an issue because this is going to last us for several years as such and it won't make a, a blind bit of difference to how this fire authority works but in reality as I said at the beginning I'm here to making sure that we have a decent fire and rescue authority and help and we had a very good uh, meeting I was only conservative on the uh, visit to our full fire station on Thursday and it was very positive and we collaborated with the officers and the uh, members of the fire service of the four stations uh, in terms of deciding what we want to do for the best for this fire authority and you know certainly I've been lobbying my own party to make sure we get a decent settlement uh, in December so we can have a, a bloody good fire authority for the best for the uh, 945,000 residents in Berkshire. Thank you. Thank you Councillor. Uh, Councillor Lovelock you, you indicated. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I think we're making heavy weather of this, to be honest, and I hope not too many members of the public are watching, because I'm sure they can't understand uh, exactly why we're arguing about this. Um, it's You said ages ago that you're going to go through each of the recommendations one at a time, making it clear at each stage exactly what it is that um, we're, being, we're voting on. Uh, I'm very happy to proceed on that basis and then the other stuff that needs sorting out before the next meeting, we can bring back to that meeting. So I, 
would um, suggest that we move to the vote and get on with this. Thank, thank you, Councillor. Thank you very much. The, the councillor over there was absolutely right. This is, by and large, a, a very under-political group and has been ever since I've been on the authority, which is more years now than I can remember. And personally, I found his speech politically confrontational, and I very much regret that. It was probably the most political speech I've heard since I've been on the authority. And I think it's a very poor retrograde step if we are going to carry on working in a non-political way, which we always have done. Um, coming back to um, what Councillor Dudley was saying, what he was saying is not in the least bit political. It's simply to clarify the wording of this document. And it's an incredibly important document. It will be the document that people refer to for many, many years to come. And therefore, I see no rush in needing to agree or disagree with it tonight. We have got to get it right. And I can't vote for something when the words are not in front of me on the basis that somebody somewhere is going to alter them. And OK, that alteration might be absolutely fine, but I don't know whether it will be or not. And until I read it, then I can't actually agree it. And I do regret the, the political tone that this has taken, because this is not a political organisation. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chair. Um, there, it, it strikes me there's two um, issues here. One is the wording uh, of reports and so on for the members and uh, a number of other typos and uh, things deleted that shouldn't have been or whatever. But that, that needs further scrutiny, I think. What what must be done now, I feel, is this change with the um, the um, sorry the champions, the member champions, especially with the EDI. I think it's really important that we, we get on with that and, and the changes to the, you know, the, the putting the two others together to make the funds for the EDI champion uh, and the inclusion of the sustainability. Um, I, uh, I think on that one, that's a distinct um, and clear change that we could make. The others possibly have a lot of questions to be answered, and I don't know whether a working group is possibly the way forward to, to clarify it and make it all straight. Okay, thank, thank you, members. Oh, sorry, Councillor Dexter Smith. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I don't think it's possible to nitpick when you're talking about standing orders. The whole point of standing orders is that they must be the one thing that gives you clarity when you have debate, that they are the, the devil in the detail. Because if, if, if there is any ambiguity, that is what you turn to, to resolve the issue, because the standing orders give you certainty. And I think in this instance, what we're uncovering as we're debating this even more is that there is lack of clarity, there is ambiguity. Uh, and um, that should not be the case with standing orders. It would normally, I would suggest, be a, a worthwhile practice in instances where uh, public bodies change their constitution, their standing orders, to have a sort of working party to have discussed this beforehand. But we haven't had that. We're coming into this debate with a set of proposals which for the most part are perfectly reasonable, but there is ambiguity. And I too am in this situation where I don't feel I can vote for something that is ambiguous and therefore I would have to abstain. I don't think it's acceptable to say 
agree the principle and we'll come back and we'll make some further changes later. Because again, there's no certainty in that. But the only way that we can have certainty is if we defer this meeting, uh, uh, this, this, this item to the next meeting. And that's what I would propose. And I think it's by extension what I detect some other people say as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, I have to say this is the first time I've gotten into a political debate in what is supposed to be a non-political gathering. Um, when fingers are pointed in that manner, it can only incite one sort of response. So I would invite those kind of responses or comments to be avoided in the spirit of trying to keep uh, one body. However, having said that, um, if I just take it, because I want to take a practical approach to this, and if the first motion is to approve the amended standing orders for Appendix A, you look at Appendix A, we're already falling into, we're into a debate around it because there's a circular point around SO8 and SO9. So, and what I thought we agreed was that it needs to be taken away and rewritten. So that by definition says we can't vote for it unless I misunderstand it. So beyond that, I don't know what's coming on in the next, but I would have just say, look, if we just take this and quickly run through it, but take a practical approach, because we've discussed some of these points, and we know that there are some that need to come back, because we just can't, we, can't, we don't know what, what the resolution is for SO8 and SO9, because you don't know whether the president or the vice chairman, what happens if they're not there. If they're, so there, there needs to be some thought given to it, really, and I think we'd already agreed that. So I just want us to take a practical approach to this and just walk through what we need to do, and so we can move on. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, I'll look. If, if it helps, no. just if I may, and I know I'm, I'm out of order here. Really. Um, I, th I think that A, B, C, and D need some rewording. I don't, I don't think anybody's got any problem with, with E. Um, the approval of the UDI chamber. I don't think anybody's got any problem with that. I think that's quite clear. But it's, it's those first first four that really do cause a problem. Thank you. I mean, I've listened to feedback, and uh, and as I say, I apologise, members. There has been some confusion over some of the some some of the wording and uh, thing because it, it is quite a complicated matter. And from the chair, I, I'm, I'm, what I'm proposing to do, the main, you're quite right, comes to Dexter Smith and, and, and others to raise, it is important that we telling orders are, are correct. And as I said, I was going to raise an amendment myself in the chair around the t some of the terminology. And there was a commitment there, as we said earlier in the meeting, that we were going to take those back to the December meeting. My view, and I, well, I'm going to call, put this to the vote, is that the rest of this, subject to some minor wording around the, some, you know, on all of them, we can, we, we, I would like to take tonight. Particularly as, as, as Councillor Brown raised, it's really important that we that we pass those 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 things around the sustainability and and, and the EDI, which is, to be quite honest, is the main thrust of the notion of what we, as a, as the priorities. And I think if you look at it, actually, be some of those are tied up in the bees in, in the earlier items they're back referred to. So I think we can make those changes. And we have a clarification about the media roles and some of those other rejections. The standing orders, I am going to defer for the final until the um, December meeting. Because as I say, even I was going to move an amendment to do with some of the terminology. I think, you know, we want to make it absolutely clear there is not a time function with that. Whereas with the other some with the other roles to do with the EDIs and 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 and, um, and, and, and um, obviously people are receiving member allowances. There is a time there is a time issue because that delays it a, 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 fur, a further month. And uh, I take what Councillor has said about that confusion, but I think it's very clear actually that we're not going to spend more than ten. And in actually, in, in under this basis, in some of them we actually might go under that threshold. I haven't actually done the maths, but I know we're not over. We're not wasting public money. So I'm, I'm from the chair. I am going to propose that we defer Appendix A, because I have listened to members and I, and I think it is important we get that right, and apologies if we, there were some typological errors, um, but we, I am going to go through from 2.2 .2 to 
and if it, to, to, to ask if we can uh, if we can approve them and, and if necessary we can obviously we can have uh, votes on those if people, members feel they can't support it but I wanted I want to know and you have my guarantee that we will go through those time codes and people have made notes here tonight about what we, what we, and those will, that will be those will be amended in line with some of that terminology particularly around the roles of the media role which is the main focus of our, de our, our debate okay so that's what that's what i propose to do because i do want this business done and we did call the meeting for this and as it turns out there are other important items that we could or rest on the agenda that it's lucky that it's good that we are meeting tonight rather than waiting until november and also the timing of the november meeting is that it is december also is good in terms of the crmp so actually the pattern of the meetings although it is an extraordinary meeting is i think in my opinion for the chair much better for the authority in terms of our decision making so i'm going to take from from the chair i'm going to move I'm going to move 2.2, which was proposed by me and seconded by Councillor Lovelock. Um, I'm going to take that to vote. So all those in favour of recommendation 2.2, the amended fire authority terms of reference. Sorry, that's B2.2. Appendix, yeah, it's 2.2. Thank you, members. That's carried. carried. 2.3, the amended management committee terms of reference. Appendix C, which I don't believe is carried. With the, with, just a second. With page, page 58. Page 58, yeah. Yeah, okay, we're all happy with that. Okay, it's good. 2.3, approve the amended, sorry, um, 2.4, approve the amended member role description with those qualifications that we spoke about in terms of the media, if we can add that wording. We're happy with this, everybody. We had a good debate on that, guys. I, I, I initially did think it was it was a duplication, Chief Executive. But um, on reflection, I think there is a subtle difference uh, bet between the two. Yeah. Um, First, the annual plan and an annual plan. So that is the subtle difference. So it's worth us checking that rather than course further. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So just that thing we heard. So I'm going to ask: you, Are we approved? We're approving 2.4. Hopefully, member roles descriptions. Yep. All those in favour? We're subject to that's vote. That's been voted on. Voted right. I've done yep. that. Right. We got there. Sorry. 2.5. Approve the EDI champion receive a special ability allowance. Effective. Which just amazing. Thank you for your support, everybody, on that. It's carried. And finally, 2.6. Approve the lead member champions reports presented. The last four authority for this year, which is a work, I think. Okay, we're happy with this, everybody. We we'll vote on this. This is carried. Okay, thank you. Look, members, thank you for your patience on, on, on this. And, I, and I'm grateful for contributions. And look, debate gets heated at times. And I think, you know, <laughs> but, you know, we, we, we're getting there. At the next meeting, we'll sort, we'll sort the rest of the standing orders, hopefully to everybody's satisfaction. Thank you. Thank you, members. So we move on now to um, item 11, which is business continuity presentation, which is Mark. We all have screens. Thank you, Chairman. Evening, uh, members. I don't want to be unkind around the ICT, given that Tony's, uh, this is Tony's last meeting, but my clicker doesn't appear to be working, so I'm going to ask uh, <laughs> Faith if she can support my... You're fired. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So, um, in fact, if I could kind of give you the nod, that would be uh, very useful indeed. Um, so we, we thought it would be a useful update to provide uh, or, or briefly discuss our arrangements around uh, business continuity, but with a particular focus on industrial action. Uh, it's possibly not lost on members that the likelihood in terms of the risk of industrial action uh, in uh, recent times has increased. So we'll, we wanted to be able to provide you with an update in terms of how we are mitigating and uh, preparing for uh, an increased likelihood of, uh, of industrial action. Uh, so a quick overview of the situation. Uh, on the 27th of June this year, uh, there was a 2% pay offer for our grey books, our uniformed staff, uh, including uh, those staff that work in the control centre. Uh, this is a, a national offer. Uh, on the 2nd of September, the FBU Executive Council announced a preparation uh, for strike ballot uh, and rejection of that offer. Uh, we understand that uh, subject to a very uh, late breaking piece of information which I'll come on to in a, in a moment that uh, the current anticipation is that the FBU will ballot its members for uh, strike action uh, early uh, to mid-October so uh, fairly imminently. Uh, up until about 3.30 this afternoon there was no new uh, revised pay offer via the National uh, Joint Council, the NJC. Um, 3.30 today however we did uh, and members have been uh, there's been a circulation to members and staff with a uh, news of a revised offer which stands at 5% which the FBU Executive Council will now uh, take away and consider. To put that into some financial context the uh, authority the service had uh, budgeted a 2.5% uh, for a 2.5% pay increase uh, and that additional 2.5% will uh, equate to approximately uh, an additional pressure of half a million pounds on the revenue budget. Uh, it should be noted that there is no additional uh, central funding to support this, so that will be a direct pressure as it stands uh, on, the, uh, on the fire authority's budget. Thank you. Um, so, of course, we, we await with bated breath around the reaction of the FBU in the latest uh, on the revised pay offer, uh, but until such a time that we have uh, clarity, we'll continue to prepare uh, for industrial action as we have been uh, for a number of uh, months, frankly. Um, just wanted to give a quick overview of the legal standing. This is uh, paraphrased, but effectively you'll be aware that the Fire and Rescue Act requires uh, the fire authority to make provisions for the purposes of firefighting, road traffic collisions and other emergencies. Uh, and we also have uh, obligations, statutory requirements uh, to put in place effective business continuity arrangements in the event of an industrial action and that is laid down in both the Civil Contingencies Act uh, and uh, Fire and Rescue National Framework. Uh, some of the language around what we must do in terms of making provisions uh, is that we must make uh, best endeavours to meet uh, the full range of service uh, and continue to do that, which is what we are doing and will continue to do. Next slide, please. Uh, so again, I, I thought it would be useful just to give a, a, an overview of what is effectively quite a complex uh, mechanism, but this uh, illustrates the timelines associated with the potential for uh, industrial action. Uh, there are uh, There is a, a, a period of effectively about 42 days uh, that where we can have a higher level of confidence and certainty around the action that is likely to be taken. That is broken into seven days uh, where we would receive a notice of a ballot. We are aware that a ballot has been uh, considered, talked about uh, by the FBU, but we haven't received official notification of that ballot. Uh, and the importance of that is as part of that seven day process, we would also receive a sample of a ballot paper. And on that, it, it, there is a requirement to specify what that industrial action would look like in terms of uh, uh, 
some of the details about uh, specific time frames, etc. Uh, etc. Et there is a, a period where members are then asked to vote on that ballot, uh, and we uh, anticipate that to be no less than 21 uh, days. And then uh, we are required to receive a, a minimum of 14 days' notice before any industrial action, which equates to approximately 42 days. The outcome of that would be effectively three three options, so that the ballot may return a, a no vote for strike, uh, or there could be a yes, and that yes could be uh, action short of strike, and that would include aspects such as, uh, or could include aspects such as uh, a ban on pre-arranged overtime, or staff acting up into uh, more kind of senior uh, management roles, which would have a, a significant impact on our ability to uh, deliver our normal uh, services given the, the lean model that we operate in uh, and our requirement uh, reliance on overtime uh, or it could be a full strike uh, and that full strike could be in a number of different uh, uh, ways it could be uh, as we saw in the 2013-2014 strikes a, a maximum uh, disruption to services with minimum impact to members so multiple short stints of industrial action uh, or conversely it could be that they hold uh, longer uh, periods as they did in the in the in the in the version of strikes prior to that back in 2002 2003 we won't know until such a time the ballot becomes clearer and of course the position that puts the service in at the moment is that we need to plan for all of those various scenarios and eventualities uh, but the summary is that we could be facing industrial action up to full strike conditions uh, as early as mid-November. Uh, next slide please, Faith. So very high level, uh, but I thought it would be worth sharing these with you. Is We've set out three guiding principles uh, over what is an enormously complex uh, and effortful uh, uh, preparation period. Uh, the first one is the undertake best endeavours to deliver core services to our communities taking a risk-based and public value approach. Um, we must make best endeavours in order to continue to deliver those services, but we have to be mindful of the impacts in terms of budgets and, uh, and others. So we must be kind of guided by those principles, but, but essentially we must make best endeavours and I'll talk about what they are uh, shortly. Uh, we will seek to maintain, uh, maintain positive relations with our workforce and those bodies that represent them, uh, including the Fire Brigades Union, by respecting individual views, rights and choice. Uh, we have a very, very positive uh, culture in Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service. We have a very uh, strong working relationship and positive working relationship uh, with the FBU uh, locally. Uh, and it is our view that uh, whilst the strike or potential for strike is relatively short-lived we must uh, be, be reminded that the culture has been uh, hard fought and, and, and uh, we must protect that in the long term so that is a, a second guiding principle for us and I suppose just uh, building on that uh, the third point there is also really crafted to be able to protect our our culture um, we will take a zero tolerance stance on unacceptable behaviours to safeguard the Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Services one team culture. We know that, or history would tell us at least, that these uh, periods of industrial uh, unrest can create uh, uh, some, some significant tensions uh, across uh, our workforce and sometimes beyond. Um, and in order to protect that uh, culture that uh, the Chief has talked about, that the HMI have recognised is, is so strong, uh, we will take a zero tolerance uh, stance on unacceptable behaviours uh, prior to, during and after the industrial or the potential for industrial action. And I would hope that uh, the Fire Authority would uh, support that position and that one of those guiding principles. Uh, next slide, please. So there are effectively four layers uh, to oversimplify, frankly, a lot of hard work that colleagues are undertaking in, in this preparation. Uh, and those layers are to rely on our uh, staff that are not taking 
uh, industrial action or we do not believe would take industrial action so members that are members of other unions or, or, or staff that aren't members of unions. Um, that is challenging uh, compared to previous uh, industrial action periods uh, due to uh, changes in the way that uh, or the data that we're able to hold in terms of uh, levels of union uh, membership so that is very much an unknown uh, but we do know that uh, in Royal Berkshire particularly there is a very high proportion of FBU members so that would be minimal. Um, in order to be able to mitigate uh, this risk and uh, provide a, a high uh, level of confidence around our business continuity we have had in place for a number of years now a, uh, a commercial uh, contract with uh, Securitas who provide resilience uh, uh, across two areas. The first area is the fire uh, emergency fire crews which equates to uh, four fire engines or up to four fire engines uh, and they will have five uh, firefighters on there uh, and are able to undertake uh, basic offensive firefighting so that means uh, entering into buildings uh, wearing breathing apparatus that that type of uh, activity uh, and also to support that, of course, we need to uh, be able to maintain core handling through our Thames Valley Fire Control Service. Uh, and we have, a, again, a secure task arrangement uh, in place to support that uh, across the Thames Valley. Um, the third layer is uh, resilience crews, and that is something we're actively working on at the moment. Um, and seeking support from either current or reti recently retired staff to provide and uh, sign a resilience uh, arrangement uh, whereby we have a greater uh, reliability in terms of their availability during periods of strike action. Uh, and the fourth uh, layer, if you like, is the emergency fire crews. Uh, and we have recently advertised uh, for that uh, and are part way through the process of that selection uh, and effectively that is bringing in uh, non-experienced uh, or, uh, or, or staff potential non-experienced uh, individuals giving them a basic level of training to be able to provide and support the other layers of resilience uh, through sort of defensive firefighting operations uh, again those certainly the last two layers we are currently working through uh, and seeing what level of uh, interest and support that we can garner through those uh, through those approaches uh, and lastly I suppose the reason I put this on there is is really just to not necessarily demonstrate all of the various uh, areas that we're working on although you can see for yourself that this is a particularly complex piece of work when you when you start to unpick the various components of it it is more to illustrate the fact that there is a huge amount of effort uh, which clearly takes time uh, and resource out of the service uh, to be able to prepare for this uh, clearly, um, I would like to think members would uh, support that level of uh, effort and resource given the, uh, the likely severity of the situation and the increasing likelihood of, of industrial action um, and it's for awareness really in terms of the level of seriousness that we are taking this risk with uh, but also the impact that has on, on colleagues in terms of the uh, ongoing preparations for it. Uh, and I believe that was the last slide. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And let's hope we don't have to use any of these resilience agreements. But it's useful to be updated on, on those that are in place. I know the immense amount of work that's gone into it, as you said. Uh, Councillor Linda. Thanks, Chair. Just a bit of clarification out on the first part, Mark. Um, the 5% offer that was just for the firefighters, because I know there was the top 2% for the Greybook staff um, and I presume for fire control as well. That hasn't been increased or are there potential for industrial activities for those or is it the offer is for them as well 5% and does that include 
the half a million pounds extra cost for the authority. Thank you. Yeah, so I, I probably needed to make it a little bit clear, but apologies, it was a very last minute uh, change given the new information. Uh, so the original pay offer to Grey Book staff, which effectively is all of our uniform staff, firefighters, uh, etc., including uh, the control staff, was 2%. That was rejected. Uh, and then a revised offer has been announced today for those same groups of staff, which would, if accepted, cost the service, the authority, an additional uh, unbudgeted uh, 500,000. So, just to go further on that, for the HQ staff who, it's the Green Book obviously, but it's mixed up, um, I is there any additional stuff on that, or is there likely industrial action like to come in? Uh, people so, like Unison, so the green, green Book staff, which is the other uh, side of the business, if you like, uh, other portion of, of the staff, they have uh, been offered uh, a different rate they've been offered a, a flat amount of uh, £1,925. Uh, that group of staff are represented by three unions. Uh, my understanding, albeit this is 24 hours uh, out of date information and this changes very quickly, uh, is that two of those unions have accepted that so it's highly likely that that offer would be accepted um, and then therefore there would be uh, the, the threat of industrial action clearly uh, dissipates because of that. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that Mark mentioned the good relations that we have with the union because a lot of people on all sides have worked really, really hard to achieve that over a number of years and very successfully. I, for one, am very proud of that and uh, opportunity to thank all of those who contributed to it. But my question is roughly how many of our workforce are in the FBU and how many roughly are in other unions such as the RFU? Well the, the difficulty is that we, we, we don't know. Um, without going into the technical details there's, there's a process called check-off uh, which used to allow us to see the union fees being paid uh, and therefore we could effectively count that. We don't know that now um, because of, of, of relatively recent changes. As I said, we think that we have a, a very high proportion of FBU members and that's across uh, our grey book staff within the whole time on call but also more recently green book staff as well. If I was to estimate, I would say it would be north of 90%, but that would be an estimation, which is one of the challenges uh, that we're working with it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark, for, for a very interesting uh, presentation. On your slide for resilience, you had as item two of your arrangement with Securitas. And I think you said that it had been in place for some significant length of time. Uh, this is a national strike. Securitas presumably can't cover every fire brigade in the, in the country. What confidence do you have that they will be able to meet their contractual requirements should you call them? Yeah, very, very good question uh, and one that colleagues uh, Doug and Jim who are taking point on that particular contract uh, management uh, have been working with Securitas directly to answer that and, and give us the confidence that we require. Uh, we, in short, uh, we have a high level of confidence uh, and the contractual arrangements are so that those individuals are, are ring-fenced effectively uh, for us and are also uh, drawn from a much greater pool. So very recently we actually increased that level of, uh, of provision and that was one of the questions, the key questions that we had was well, how, how can you guarantee that we'll have those numbers of people, those numbers of staff with the right skills uh, and training. Uh, and the answer uh, has been provided that has given us that, that high, high level of confidence. Um, you're right in that clearly this is a national debate uh, and we want to keep it as, as such uh, and manage the impacts locally. Um, I think having spoken uh, to other FRSs across uh, the country around this 
issue. Uh, I think they're quite uh, envious of the position that we find ourselves in in some respects to have this arrangement in place as a baseline. Thank you. Councillor Callum. Thank you, Mark. Um, a, a technical point more than anything else. Um, with Securitas, are they providing crews or crews and appliances? Because obviously if they're providing appliances, there's communications issues and everything else. So I assume they're using our our appliances, so the comms between the uh, fire control and the appliances would be as normal. Yeah, absolutely. So we are providing the equipment uh, and the PPE. There's a period of time where we prepare those vehicles to ensure that uh, the vehicles and the ancillary equipment is fully ready, working uh, and can support our kind of business as usual approaches. Uh, and in addition to that, the staff, the security staff that would be operating those vehicles are also given appropriate training and familiarisation on an ongoing basis. Thank you. Any more questions? Councillor Smith again. Sorry, uh, just to, to understand. So, Securitas are providing you the manning and you're providing the facility, the, the uh, equipment. What, you, you mentioned four engines and core handling. What sort of percentage does that represent in terms of cover compared with uh, normal day business? Well, ordinarily, our CRMP suggests that we should have 14 whole time. Uh, 14 fire engines uh, and we will have up to four. Uh, the reason I say up to four is, is twofold really. No, number one, they actually provide us with a number of people rather than a, a specific number of fire engines. So it's up to us really how we deploy that or deploy those people I should say. Uh, and we believe that the greatest impact uh, for, res for resident safety um, and increasing their offensive capability, so their ability to make a, a meaningful interaction in the first parts of an incident in some in some, res some respects, uh, is that if we were to have five people on there on those particular fire engines, that would enhance that capability. Councillor Linden. Yeah, going further to Councillor Smith, obviously we have specialist vehicles, Argo Heavy Lift and River Rescue, um, which are specialists. Uh, obviously that, that is an extra account um, to provide those services. So Mark, could you comment on that at all please? Yeah, yeah just to say that um, clearly with the limited amount of resource that we would anticipate having, uh, it's important that we uh, ensure that those vehicles, those, that, that equipment, that capability is where we believe it will have the greatest impact uh, to resident safety. Uh, if we are in a reasonably luxurious position where we have a, a greater number of fire engines than we currently plan for, then we would consider putting on additional life-saving uh, specials. Uh, until we know how many people we'll be able to deploy, it's very difficult to make that assessment at this point, albeit colleagues such as Doug are developing uh, um, scenarios and plans to be able to uh, deploy that depending on the numbers of people that we would have available to us. Uh, in addition to that we're also working with our partners, uh, neighbours in the Thames Valley and beyond to understand actually if we are able to somehow share uh, some specialist capabilities, albeit clearly that is over a much larger footprint, so the uh, speed certainly of uh, response would be impacted by that one. Councillor Cannon. Yeah, sorry, just again, back to Securitas. So, as I understand, we're talking up to four appliances will be crewed. Is that per shift? So, it, in effect, we'll have those appliances available around the clock rather than one appliance for one shift. Uh, it is per shift, yes. So, um, the most likely scenario would be that you would have four on for a period of industrial action. Where it could becomes slightly uh, uh, more complex is it depends on the I suppose the uh, the strike tactics or strategy or periods of time that the FBU may choose to employ so for example we would need to 
sorry, there would be there could be a situation where we would need to pro make provision for appropriate rest periods for those Securitas colleagues, which may mean that for a period of time we would have to sort of cycle that rest period through. So for a short period it may drop down to three, or we might look to uh, do something else in terms of that rotor system. But our anticipated amount is, is four at any one time, plus plus Thank our you. other Thank layers. You. Yeah. Uh, just of course, you've got new members here. Just let me give a figure for the 2014 strike action. What the revenue cost of the authority was for that particular action? Uh, I wasn't here then. Um, it was around about 50 occasions. So, for provide some context, nationally it was around 50 occasions of short uh, periods. So, anything from from memory, 45 minutes up to sort of several hours uh, across many 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 months um, I think for Berkshire the revenue impact was in the region of about 1.2 million and that's just been confirmed by my colleague as well so I'm reasonably confident that that's the uh, that was the amount so so not an insignificant amount well, that's the question is. yeah so anyhow let's let's hope we don't have to come to that but I think it was useful obviously we can particularly can you remember to have these updates on what what, what we do in the the event of uh, in the event of industrial action, which we hope we can avoid. So thanks. Sorry, is another pretty indicating. Sorry, Councillor Dudley. No, just not not a question, Chair. I just wanted to say a couple of things. That's okay with you. Um, you know, industrial action is not something that I, I know our crews look on lightly. Um, they are faced with unprecedented, unprecedented. Can't speak. Um, demands on, on, on their financial workload as, as everybody is these days. I mean, you know, everybody can talk about political things causing uh, the cost of living, but, you know, let's face it, we have a war in Ukraine, which I think most things can feed back into. That's what's causing a lot of it. Um, and, and even though we have an absolutely fantastic relationship with our staff in Royal Berkshire, um, and they are absolutely brilliant, I think that members, especially some new members, need to realise that when the FBU goes to a ballot, they go to a ballot nationally. And, and it really, all it takes is for London and one other Met to vote for strike action. And it doesn't matter what anybody else does in the country, they will have a majority because those two areas, or well, London certainly has, you know, a fantastic majority of FBU members. Um, and, um, and therefore, it may well be that our firefighters, because of the union collective agreement, are forced to go on strike when perhaps they wouldn't have voted to do so. Um, and I think that that needs to be stressed, that it wouldn't be Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue staff necessarily voting in the majority going to go on strike, but if nationally, um, the vote goes, and as I say, it just takes London and one other Met, like Birmingham, to vote for it. That would that would cover the whole country. Um, so I, I think you know we need to have a certain amount of um, sympathy with our staff as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor, for that clarification. Of course, conversely, it only takes London to vote against the action, and then the action is ended. So it can work both ways, but. No, I mean, I, I take on board, yeah, well, you know, and that's how, to take on board your, your sentiments, as I say, I think the overwhelming desire of us locally and also most of the chiefs and chairs nationally is to avoid this in all industrial action because, it's, as I asked the question, it can be very damaging to your finances. And then when it's settled, obviously, there's still further ramifications as we've, out, as we've um, outlined in the report. So we, we await developments and we'll keep members up to date where we can on what, um, what, 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 what is going on with those ne complex negotiations. So thank you very much Mark, for your presentation and I think I say it was very useful. We move on to um, agenda item 12 which is the summer heatwave report and presentation again an unprecedented situation this summer and Katie Mills is going to take us through some of the, some of the, uh, some of the issues there. Good evening very much. 
very brief introduction as Doug and Trigger prepared a report, uh, presentation for them. Right, thanks, Doug. So, just to quickly preface that by saying that it's not unusual to experience sustained periods of hot weather during the summer, but certainly on occasion during the last summer, we went beyond normal, yes. you could say, in the conditions that were faced by our teams, um, and they were extremely challenging. And Doug's going to outline the operational impact of that and our response and trick will go through the prevention activity that was put in place to mitigate that impact as best as possible. Thanks, Over to Doug and Trick. Over to you. Thanks Katie. Thanks Chair. Um, would you just move us on to the next slide please Faith? Or the first slide. <laughs> and we'll just wait for that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so there was, there was an early recognition by officers that we were likely to encounter a busy period over the summer months due to the climatic conditions during the spring um, and, and indeed the, the long-term forecast for the summer. As anticipated, incident numbers significantly exceeded an average summer period, much of which can be attributed to fires in the open. The impacts to the service were both an increase in incident mobilisations but also, in many cases, high numbers of appliances and special appliances required a specific inc incidence for sustained periods. Next slide, please. As climate-related re demand usually affects large geographical areas, members will not be surprised to hear that partners across our borders were also challenged during the period, and I'm, so, I'm sure you saw uh, plenty of that on the news as well. Officers work closely with colleagues from neighbouring services to support mutual aid requests, albeit there were occasions where command decisions were rightly taken to ensure sufficient re resilience was retained within our own county. And there were some instances where, where officers had to say no, essentially, to, to some of the over-the-border over support. The graph uh, on the slide there provides an illustration of support into Berkshire and from Berkshire to other services. Um, mostly but not exclusively in and out of the Thames Valley partnership. As you'll observe, the outgoing support outweighed that incoming into our service. Next slide, please. Whilst officers sought to build further resilience over the period, it will not be surprising to members that a significant increase in demand had a negative impact on the service response standard, with the average across July and August being 66.5% against a target of 75%. A target which I think as long as I can remember in SPB reports we tend to hit around that 75 but this was a particularly challenging period and, and, and it stretched resources. It is acknowledged that periods of spate conditions will challenge that standard by our officers. Next slide please. Uh, sorry, bear with me. Um, just wanted to make a, an additional point on the response standard piece actually it's probably just worth noting um, the use of our on-call in such periods is vitally important in terms of providing that operational resilience. On one particular day, for example, Mortimer tweeted uh, that they'd been mobilised to 19 incidents, including all parts of Berkshire, Buckinghamshire and London, and that's quite exceptional for, uh, for an on-call station in Berkshire. In terms of uh, our kind of business continuity and our resilience, so we recognise the likely need for additional support and resilience through the period and our critical event management team and command and control structure was established early in July and continued to meet right to the end of August whilst the service was either in adverse condition, weather condition amber or indeed at times condition red. This approach ensured real-time information in relation to the weather forecasting and the fire severity index were being sufficiently considered against our planning and resourcing. Decisions were taken to support our capability to deal with fire and water risk appropriately. We ensured our specialist vehicles were immediately available. On some occasions we increased our water rescue capability insofar as we put additional capability in the east of the county um, and we also sought to make the on-call provision as high as possible to meet the increased demand. During periods of high demand, be that a single large incident or a protracted period, the service will stand up the operational support room. This function, which is usually made up of a mixture of green and grey book staff, will support the implementation and decisions directed through the command structure and address real-time resourcing and logistical issues. The op support room was established many times throughout July and August and on occasions it was staffed by up to six people for a whole day. 
Whilst this draws resource away from the business as usual activity, it was crucially important in the coordination of our response to the spate conditions. As well as the inward facing planning and resilience, the service remained engaged in the local resilience forum planning and response. Regular meetings were established to gain a common understanding of partner pressures and identify opportunities for mutual aid and support. As I say, impacts to business as usual were felt across all parts of the service, be that flexible duty officers reprioritising managerial work due to um, the operational pressures they were facing, or indeed Green Book members of staff being redeployed to operational support roles. Whilst this comes with a cost, I think the way that staff from across the organisation pulled together to support a sustained period of heightened operational activity is testament to how the organisation focuses on its primary role of serving our community. I'm going to hand over to Trig and next slide please. Brilliant, Th thank you for that. Okay, so this, this slide provides an indication of the increased work right across the uh, prevention function. As detailed in the, the paper, um, as, as is normal practice, prevention teams and station crews uh, will deliver a plan of water and wildfire related safety activity uh, throughout the summer months. However, given the severity and volume of demand this year, the uh, critical event management team provided direction on an even greater level of visibility and targeting of higher risk areas. As well as working extremely hard at times in responding, crews were dedicated and directed to carve out time to ensure safety messaging was getting out to all of our communities. One particular activity that would be useful to evaluate with a view to potential wider rollout uh, was partnership, a partnership initiative with the Royal Borough of Windsor and Maidenhead. The main sports centre in Maidenhead offered free swimming lessons to every teenager um, every weekday of the school holidays. Our role in that partnership was to use that time slot to go and talk to the young people who attended and then provide them uh, with water safety advice. If we, if we look at the, the slide itself, you can see the activities there for wildfire. Crews uh, and prevention staff uh, went out to high risk places, Swinley Forest, uh, Jubilee River, places where we know that we've had issues uh, in previous periods of hot weather. We put out press releases um, really focusing on messaging surrounding water safety, um, etc. Moving on to the, uh, to the next slide. No, no, rewind. rewind. <laughs> okay. okay, we've got a slight, a slight uh, issue with the deck there, not a problem. Um, so, one of the things I wanted to talk about was um, some of the, uh, the, the things that we put out um, to try and target uh, people who are at risk of drowning. Um, and one of the, the things I was going to show you uh, was uh, a picture, um, just to say that this isn't a new thing. Uh, for us. This is something that we do experience regrettably <coughs> on a regular basis um, and we, 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 we go out and we, we, we put up um, posters, we've got boards that are put up around the um, uh, uh, around uh, open water areas telling people that there's no swimming in certain areas uh, and the dangers related to that swimming. But beyond that we've uh, installed uh, several um, water safety boards that also include uh, throw lines and directions and guides on how to use those throw lines. So in known danger spots, people will know how to how to react. But they also serve the function for people who are considering going into the water in those areas to warn them uh, of the risk that they face. We've also worked closely uh, with the Samaritans um, with regard to people who um, have, have committed suicide in, in our waterways uh, in previous years. Um, and indeed on Caversham Bridge now there's a, there's a, a, a small plaque uh, on the bridge, low down, where somebody who was standing on the bridge potentially would look as, as they're looking down in, in, in desperation and it refers them to the Samaritans. We've also uh, put in place uh, means whereby people might be able to self-rescue um, should they, they go in the water in that area. So moving on to the slide that you can see, no, no, staying on the slide. The slide that you can see in front of you now. <laughs> okay, so this is um, looking at our, our communications uh, and, and engagement. Which 
which I'm just trying to catch up with in my notes. There we go. So in addition to the face-to-face -face, uh, presentation activity that our communications and engagement uh, team um, engaged with, they were also extremely busy um, fielding both media inquiries into incidents, uh, but also pushing out prevention messaging across multiple platforms. Uh, this included uh, six press releases uh, on radio and TV, uh, including BBC Berkshire, Harp FM and ITV Meridian. You can see my guest appearance there, top left. There was 49 separate press releases uh, and statements that were provided uh, over the period. 62 uh, Twitter posts which were shared on the central Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service account that had a combined reach of 163,000 uh, and around 5,000 uh, engagements. There were 10 um, Facebook safety messages posted um, and these, these were, were published which were also shared to the Berkshires, um, the, the largest community groups across Berkshire. Uh, and these posts had a combined reach of around 187,000 with almost 9,000 engagements. There were five website articles published uh, on the Royal Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service website uh, relating to the heat wave um, and, and other safety messaging. So you can really see how the prevention activity took every opportunity, both with engagements uh, with our uh, operational crews, uh, also making full use of um, uh, mainstream media and social media at the same time. So with that, I'll uh, move on to the next slide, please, Jeff Lake. Yeah. Back to me and, and the final slide, but, but an important one. So um, whilst the summer was exceptionally dry and hot, it's reasonable to assume that climate conditions will continue to make this sort of seasonal demand more normal and foreseeable. For this reason, it's vitally important that the service undertake a thorough debrief of the events to understand both shorter term and longer term implications and capability requirements moving into that sort of CRMP territory when we talk about the longer term. Planning for industrial action and operation bridge, amongst other things, have have a bit, um, sorry, impacted the ability to progress this this debrief. But the work has now been commissioned in service delivery, uh, and will be very useful to inform future activity. That's it for, for the presentation. We're happy to take any questions. Thanks, everybody. Any questions? Um, I'll go to Councillor Werner first, and then Councillor Dudley, then Councillor. Oh, Thank you for that presentation. Um, I, I think. You'd Outstanding performance from, from the fire service. I, 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 I know, for instance, you, you pretty much saved Ashley Hill from t being turning into an inferno, um, and I'm sure there are so many other locations across Berkshire which uh, um, that's the case. Um, obviously, as you say, it, it's going to be an increasing problem with climate change year on year. Um, and I'm really glad to see the, uh, you know, you're really taking the learning seriously so that, you know, you did perform brilliantly, but there's always ways you can do even better and you can deal with these things when, when they get even bigger in subsequent years. Um, just, just coming back quickly on, on, on the sort of, uh, the, the prevention, which has to be key, doesn't it? And I, I know you're doing a lot of work on, on water safety, which is great across Berkshire. Um, and on, on the field fires were a major problem, obviously, because of climate change. Um, some land, most landowners, you know, know how to deal with this kind of stuff. Some of them not so good. They leave three years worth of um, uh, hay on their fields, which is basically, you know, one bit cigarette ash and the whole thing goes up. Do, what sort of um, communication do you have with those sort of landowners to, to give advice? Just an example of that kind of preventative work. Yes, yeah, so I suppose a really good example of that and, and a big example is, is Swindley Forest, where we work really, really closely with, with the, the Crown Forestry there, um, giving advice with regard to fire breaks, uh, giving advice with regard to, to country, but also working with them uh, in order to pre-plan for any incident that might occur. Um, but also we've done an awful lot of work in that area, working with members of the public, who of course are probably the most likely source of ignition. Um, so not just on, on, on the days of the heat wave, but as part of the local safety plans, um, this is planned in work that happens. Um, so, so the crews are going out there, they're spending significant time interacting with people, walking their dogs, riding their bicycles, um, speaking with them. It's got the added advantage that also it gives us sometimes a very early warning if a fire were to be started because people can spot things when they know what they're looking for. Okay, thank you. Councillor Dutton. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I must admit, I'm probably one of the few people in this room that can remember the fires in Sweetly Forest in 2011 um, and um, what devastation that caused. I think that you need to recognise, of course, that firefighters working in those heat, was it 40 degrees at one point it reached, I think, in, in, in Berkshire. Um, of course, they're going out to incidents in their gear, in 40 degrees of heat, and walking towards a fire, which, I mean, you know, it's not a cool thing, in the, in the best of things. Uh, so I think that, you know, that what what they did was absolutely fantastic. The one question from me, if I may, Chair, is, is about the cross-border incidents that I think Doug highlighted with that graph, um, and that quite that highlighted to me the amount of amount of times that we were called over the border into our Thames Valley region partners. Um, can you tell me were there any incidents when, because of our own critical resilience, we refused cross-border assistance? Uh. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, yes, so there were. Um, so Thames, Thames Valley ultimately is a borderless mobilising system. Um, so it would be very unusual to to not allow assets to be moved across those Thames Valley borders. That's part of the agreement that you know the authority are bought into. So th there's probably that sort of um, how do I say it? those sort of, sort of command conversations, I suppose, between those, those uh, officers in the three services that took place, where we would just support some of that control decision making, thinking about how resources were allocated across the Thames Valley piece. So, in that respect, it was probably a more collaborative piece. Where we did refuse resources was into other neighbouring services where they needed things such as some of our specialist vehicles. Uh, the Zetros being a good example was requested, certainly one occasion I remember in Surrey, um, and, and we held it back because we knew that we just needed it in, a, in our own county at the time. So um, slightly different arrangements inside and outside of the Thames Valley, but as much as possible trying to be collaborative with partners when, when making those kind of command judgment decisions. Hey, Chair, just come back on that, thank you. Um, I, I agree with what you're saying, and I understand the, the borderless uh, nature of Thames Valley Fire Control. Um, but, I mean, we've, we've got to, in this room, reflect and represent the wishes of the Royal Borough, sorry, the Royal Berkshire County taxpayers. Um, and our taxpayers expect the Berkshire resources that they've paid for to be available for Royal Berkshire people. Um, so I just wanted clarification that even though we may have a Royal Berkshire and Thames Valley fire control, there are times when we have to be a bit selfish and say, no, we need these for our people. So, so if, I, if I might come in there, Councillor, I mean, um on the, on the busiest day, I was uh, actually the uh, level four uh, guard command um, for, for the service. Um, and certainly those decisions were taken uh, in order to maintain fire cover within Berkshire. Um, what I would point out is that uh, where we were attending cross-border incidents, it was quite often Berkshire crews who were calling for support in uh, the other Thames Valley counties, in particular Buckinghamshire. So we really were making a balance and act supplying our own crews with the support that they needed to deal with major incidents at the same time as maintaining uh, sufficient fire cover to, to cater for the, the rest of the county. So it was a balancing act that those decisions were taken. Thank you, Chair. Just an important addition to that is just for members' clarity in relation to whether we refuse or not to mobilise assets. Within the Fire and Rescue Services Act, there is a section 13 and a section 16 to that act, which are about what they deemed reinforcement and mutual aid schemes. So there is a legal requirement to provide a base level of support to neighbouring counties at their request. Uh, so there are occasions where, providing we've got the assets available, legally we couldn't refuse to support another county up to a certain level. And just to add to that, if I may, sorry, just to add to that, that that's why some specials are, are slightly different within those arrangements. And just to give you a bit of context to, to the point Trig made, 
um, well, first some assurance that, that commanders at level three and level four get informed by Thames Valley Control when we drop to certain levels, obviously, and we have business rules around, you know, kind of minimum numbers and how we would move resources around. But in terms of the context, there was, there was one occasion, I think it was on the 18th of July, that 40 degree day that you referenced, where there was a request for um, an appliance into London and it was an hour's travel distance from Ascot to a, to a part of London to a house fire. And, you know, that, that just illustrates kind of how unique that day was, I suppose, and the challenges we were facing. So some of those decisions had to be made reasonably dynamically. Thank you, Chief, and thank you, Doug, for that answer. The, the, my, my concern, and, and I do understand our, our, our responsibilities with regards to the self contingencies Act. Uh, my, 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 more, more of a concern to me is, is within Thames Valley, um, not on this inspection, but on our previous inspection, um, I was actually in uh, our control centre when the inspectors were in there, um, and without wishing to name names, there was an inspector actually asked what all of the dots on the screen meant across the border that were in a certain colour, and then they were told those stations are not available. So that actually meant a big swathe of Thames Valley was down to us, because those stations, on call stations, weren't available across the border. Um, and I'm just making sure that, although I know we do charge over a certain amount if we have to go over the border too many times, you know, the people of Berkshire are not subsidising the people of other counties for their lack of resilience, if you like. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank, thanks for those points. And on the, on the point of the, around the inspectors, um, when they, they were inspecting the service at the same time as these, as these pressures, and we quite rightly opted they offered us the opportunity of perhaps not to come because of the, the, those pressures and we said no no we want, we want you to see the service you know operating under these pressures you know and showing our resilience which I think was a good mark in, the, in its favour um, but no points taken as well Councillor Dudley. Um, Councillor Lovelock. Yes thank you and I'm very glad you asked for this report uh, Chair because I think it's really interesting it's highlights for me that this isn't just a one in however many years incident is going to likely happen again um, and in a way we've got to be prepared for it being not the norm as such but certainly a regular event so one question is in terms of equipment I'm you know a lot of people go into the woods to have a barbecue or whatever else how what sort of equipment um, have we got that enables the, the crews to do that um, and do we as an authority need to be looking at a different range of equipment to deal with those incidents in places like that. And the second question is about the swimming um, and uh, it's obviously there will be differences between communities where in some places parents can afford to send their children for swimming lessons and so on. They do get some swimming on the curriculum not enough in my opinion um do you go into schools i know you can't go into them all the time but in, in order to try and press home the message um to the more vulnerable age groups the, the dangers of just leaping into the river or wherever else and we're never far from water anywhere in Berkshire are we Kenneth, the Thames and all the rest of it and can, so it's from the chart can add i mean obviously we sadly had three, yeah, I was three just deaths say and that, two of them were children. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but obviously this takes on that seriously, so I think it's a good question. Thanks. So, yeah, it's just, what more can we do to try and um, help ensure that uh, young people are both aware of the dangers but also uh, learn to swim adequately? If I, I'll pick up the first question, if I may, and, uh, and Trig's going to take the second part. So, just to give you some assurance, we do have. Um, quite sophisticated capabilities. It stands in terms of off-road vehicles, uh, the, the water spouts that we have at Bracknell, off-road vehicles dotted around the county, uh, and obviously water rescue capability. So in terms of our preparedness to respond to these types of spate conditions, whether it's wildfire or, or flooding or indeed water rescue type things, um, you know, we, we have those things in place. And, and I guess to some extent, 
the, the flip side of the discussion we just had around mutual aid and supporting partners, that's one of the benefits of that Thames Valley kind of portless mobilising and the mutual aid arrangements whereby services can support each other with those sort of capabilities. There's, I think there's a legitimate question for CRMP to, to look at, you know, review that capability moving forward, noting the point you made and I made earlier that these sorts of climatic conditions are probably likely likely to become more than more than norm. So it seems opportune that we would look at that, and we, we will look at that through our CRMP, and, and probably a more capability-focused kind of approach, as opposed to maybe X number of fire engines and some specials. So we're in a reasonable place with the circumstances we find ourselves in, but certainly we need to look to the future and, and, and what adjustments we need to make would be quite wild. So for, for, for the second part um, of your question with regard to, to water safety and what, what more can we do um, for, for, for young people, really if we look at what we already do, we, we do get out to schools um, quite, quite significantly. Every school in the county is, is, is offered uh, both road and water safety for their, uh, for their year sevens, uh, which, is, which is the age group that we're particularly targeting uh, with regard to it. Where we've had fire fatalities, we've got out into the communities, we've worked with um, the, the, the local authorities, we've worked with local partners, canals and river trusts, um, and we've um, particularly done a lot of work um, within drowning prevention partnerships. Um, and that's everything from getting out and putting the safety message out there to people, putting up the boards that I've talked about as, as a warning uh, to young people or to anybody not to enter the water in those in those areas, um, but also to change the environment of those areas. For example, the Jubilee River, where we've had people going in and we've had a, a significant number of drownings in, in, in a very small area. They're doing landscaping uh, around those areas to put bushes in place to make it harder for people to actually enter the water in those dangerous uh, areas. Um, where young people have, have, have unfortunately lost their lives, again our safety education teams have gone into schools uh, that those young people uh, were connected with in order to provide uh, safety education yet again to the young people uh, within those schools. We've engaged with community safety partnerships again to, to try and uh, identify other partners such as Thames Valley Police where we then go on patrols both with um, the uh, uh, PCSOs uh, and, and firefighters throughout the, um, the, the the drought period and particularly the heat wave uh, period our crews were asked to go out twice per shift and target known areas where young people go into the water and they've uh, interacted directly with young people as they're getting ready to jump off of bridges um, and, and, and are engaged in swimming we provide the education message to people we don't say you can't go and swim in, in open water because we've realised that doesn't work. And so we support the message uh, given uh, across the country, which is how to swim safely, swimming groups with recognised clubs in safe areas so that young people and all people can, can identify how they can safely interact with water. So it's an ongoing thing and it's something which we can, we can never stop doing because it's an education piece that we just need to keep working with. And it's all supported and backed up through the messaging, again, through our comms department social media reminding people. As we move into the winter months we get a different type of, of issue with water where young people are tempted to go out onto ice. Uh, quite often we see uh, people's pets run out onto ice and then and then fall into the uh, into the open water and that then leads to people trying to rescue them. So I message in shifts and changes as we move into the winter months. But it, in answer to your question it's an ongoing thing but we, we really are fully engaged um, right across the service. Very comprehensive answer. I mean, one, one from me because we just remember as we visited the South Fire Station um, on uh, last week, and one of the issues they raised obviously, they mentioned the Jubilee River and the dangers there, but there's also the drownings that several children have all come in the east of the county. So, what additional resources are going to be deployed in, in that area, and also some better technology that was mentioned in terms of cameras on boats and things like that? Because it clearly is a concern, and you know. Do all these instances, I don't, the service couldn't have done any more in terms of our response because it's a prevention medal measure, but also if you are called to emergency, to have the right equipment. So there's an east situation here, so I just wonder what we're doing. So I can update that we've got a water rescue review actually ongoing at the moment as part of our previous CRP commitments, um, and that's specifically looking at the risk profile in the county and where it would be best to place 
our assets. In principle, um, through that review, it's identified that um, it would be good to see additional resources into the county, and we need to now factor that into our wider CRP about how we allocate that resource and what that looks like. And that will take into account, you know, skills, training, ability, and equipment. So it's a well-developed piece of work um, that's being considered as we speak. Thanks, OK. Because, and so, uh, Councillor Brown. Yeah, sure. I'm, I wonder if this is something we could bring to an audit and governance committee. Because um, um, I understand there's going to be a new brief. Obviously, you can be equipped with this deployed and what, and what we can do in terms of resources. And I think that's a good job for the government. Although, just to add, if it's CRMP, it will need to come yeah. through our authority for decision making. So, any changes, significant changes to our response model, will come to all members for consideration as part of that CRMP process. Right. So, the, sorry, Joe. Yeah, uh, it was quite useful on Thursday because uh, speaking to the uh, crews at Slough on this, but also that um, the police no longer provide Thames Valley Police divers, and we've also worked with the Lowland uh, Oxford Lowland Rescue as well, and their expertise in using cameras uh, to locate uh, people in rivers and whatever, because obviously we've got to discuss it, because obviously at the moment we don't do one that was also came with it. Yes, so your response actually. <coughs> Just to say that we were doing that through the summer months, so Doug mentioned about working with partners, Parkshire Lowland Search and Rescue was one of those partners that we were proactively working with over the summer, particularly in the east of the county, during the very hot weather, and part of the water review is looking at how we engage and work with our partners to make best use of their resources as well as our own, recognising that we have you know, limited resources, so how best can we work collectively um, to rescue purposes in our Thanks. So. So I think that the useful piece of work I know Councillor Brown is indicating. I, I just wonder, there seems to be a bit of confusion about statutory duty between the police and fire services to what happens with water rescues and retreats and stuff. I, I don't know if that needs raising elsewhere. Yeah, I think it was quite a timely reminder on Thursday to, to visit the station and just to hear uh, some of the concerns and queries from uh, frontline staff. So, um, not what, not resting on our laurels uh, today. At a meeting this morning with SCAS, uh, sorry, South Central Ambulance Service and Thames Valley Police and others as part of a Berkshire Resilience Group. Uh, that item was particularly raised uh, by myself. Uh, and we will be taking forward a working group to understand how we can work more closely together on that as well. And also the fact that the police seem to be getting the money for water rescue, but aren't doing it, we're doing it, and we're not getting the money. Is anything going to be done to help us, fire service, get the money since we're doing the work? Uh, I, th I think as part of that working group, we'll understand the, the, the financial implications and arrangements. Thank you, everybody, for some questions. And we saw, as, we, as I said in my other remarks, we can start the CRMP process. Hopefully, the December meeting and some of those issues will come up again and we can look at them in more detail. But thanks very much, members, and thanks for the presentation, Drew and Doug and Katie. And the recommendation is that we. Yes, on HD. We, we have, so we note the recommendations. Everybody happy to note that? Right. Oh.
Yes, members, this is a uh, good evening. This is just a paper to note as uh, the actual consultation response was returned in July for the 26th of July deadline. Um, members were invited to the 12th of July sort of cross party meeting to look at the um, details of the consultation, which looked at people, professionalism, and governance. And attached to Appendix A is the final version that was submitted on your behalf, uh, agreed with the Chair, Councillor Gissings. So really to note um, the details of uh, the items in Appendix A. Yeah, very briefly, Chair. Um, I mean, I know we've sent it off and I, I really uh, appreciate the comments uh, that get on this, but uh, it, it is quite clear and we just found that with uh, Metropolitan Police uh, and while Thames Valley is in a far better state police force um, that really the police and crime commissioners should really be concentrating on improving the police service and worrying about the fire service which is totally different and having one person running it I think it's much more important that councillors do have a role in uh, fire and rescue services and the stress that fact that uh, there are different organisations but also there are difficulties and we need to improve quite a number of the police services throughout uh, the UK so uh, in all four nations so it's just something that we, we need to set diplomatically in the future. Thanks Chair. Agreed. <laughs> are we happy? Well, I, yeah, I think the collaboration work that uh, the three fire authorities um, in Thames Valley and Thames Valley Police do is really some outstanding work. So I'm not sure it's actually necessary to go in this direction because it, there's no gain because we're already fantastic collaboration between us. So. And I'm going to say from the chair that obviously you can see the input from this meeting. I know we may have haggled over standing orders because we believed it was important, but there's lots of you know people questioning, raising issues make wanting service improvements I'm not certain that capability would be done by just one person um, who's also got his role split so that's the issue isn't it it's about local accountability but we have responded in that way and let's hope we can keep the status quo certainly in, uh, in the Thames Valley and in Berkshire in particular okay I'll put the recommendation we we're going to note the report thank you right and we move on to agenda item 14 which is the forward plan, which I'm sure you've all assiduously read. Are we happy to... Uh, just the change. Yeah, sorry, um, you, you have mentioned the, the change, uh, which is obviously... The change of the fire authority. Yeah, the change of the fire authority meeting from November the 1st to November the... Yes. to December the 19th, and I think November the 1st there'll be something else on that night, but you'll be notified of that in due course. So thanks very much. Uh, who wants to move that we accept the forward plan? Thank you, Commons Council Dudley. And second, uh, Councillor Shepherd Bay. All those in favour of, of the Ford plan for the new change of Christmas fire authority meeting. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. And so. Sorry, Oh, item 15. I've, yeah, right, we're moving on very swiftly. So we've got item 15 is the minutes of the standing committees. Um, to note those. To note those. Are we happy to note those? And the 16th, the date of the next meeting is the 19th of December. Thank you, Graham, you're on my right. You know, no, but it, as amended, it's published before. But So we, with an amendment to say 19th of December, is that accepted? Yeah, yeah. You, thank you, Kenton. Yeah, because this was done before we changed it. Okay. Do you want me to put the recommendation? Yeah, you can, we can do that one. I was going to do that from the chair. We now need to exclude, we we'll go to the part two, we need to express, exclude the press, not better watching this, and the public. Members of the public need to get. <laughs> this is the